And looking back, you can see the Lord's hand at work in your life, hopefully. I'm sure that he has been. Hopefully you have noticed, seen it, and are giving thanks for his persevering grace in your life. Well, here at the end of the year for the next week, uh, we have a few things going on this week. Uh, the office will be closed tomorrow. The men will study on Tuesday evening. The bog will meet on Wednesday evening. Um, next Sunday, hopefully, we'll be, be restarting uh, our, our uh, GCF groups. And um, today, uh, being the end of the year and just on the threshold of 2024, uh, the uh, social concerns under the leadership of Phil Snyder plan to have a, uh, a prayer gathering after the service, and uh, he's sick, and half of the social concerns, as far as I can, have heard, is kind of under the weather, but we are going to pray. And I would say, we said 12.15, but I would say, let's just say half an hour after the service is over. Um, if you can, if you'd like to join, we're just going to look back and give thanks. We're going to look ahead and ask God's blessing, and I uh, hope you can make it to pray after the service is over. But remember, just look at your watch about the time we end and say, oh, 30 minutes. Hopefully that will give us enough time for everything we've got to get put up, put up for those who want to be a part of our prayer time. Also, elders, I'm hoping that we can have our regular meeting not next week, but this week, meaning January the 2nd. I'll be contacting you one-on-one -on -one to make sure that that is a go. Oh. I need to remind you about undecking the halls. That would be January the 13th at 9 a.m. And also you see, uh, you may see a, uh, an announcement in the bulletin about tag team bowling, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, also we're mindful uh, today of uh, the Pickett family. Al's brother passed away this week. And so your uh, prayers for him, for, for Al and his family would be much appreciated. Pastor Groves is gonna bring us KKT. Good morning, everyone. I'm at, the, I'm at the end of a cold, believe it or not. So I'm struggling with my voice only this morning. But anyway, let's all stand together as we recite our verse together. I'll save as much voice as I can. And uh, this is a great passage, and uh, it's one that we truly need to remember. And so without further ado, let's read it together, and then we'll try it, okay? Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Okay? Matthew 11, 28, and 29. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart and you will find rest unto your souls. That's a great one. 
Now we've finished all the verses, and so now we're going to start over again on the verse. That's good because you only, you only have around 25 verses for the year. And then we got uh, all those verses to review some more. I don't know, do you have the one for next time? This is starting all over again, reviewing them, and that's a good thing for us. So read next week's with me, and then take your bulletin, fold it over, and keep it in your pocket this week, and look over it every chance you get, and meditate on it, pray it back to the Lord. Second Peter 1, 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called him unto us by his own glory and excellence. Okay? You may be seated. This is our time for the morning prayer. And what I would like to encourage you to do this morning, first of all, is just bow your heads together, close your eyes, and contemplate, contemplate heaven. Paul tells us in Colossians 4, 3 and 4, to set our minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Heaven is the place where the worship of God is what it should be. And as we prepare our hearts this morning, I would encourage you to be mindful of what is going on there and let that fuel your own prayers at this moment while I lead us. Our Father in heaven, it is a delight and privilege. It is a great and wonderful and amazing gift that you've given us to give us access into your very presence. Even to worship you, Lord. This is not a duty of drudgery, but our delight. Here is why there are pleasures forevermore in glory is because there is worship in which your people are engaged. Worship that arises from a recognition of the greatness of who you are, the glory of who you are, the holiness and wonder of your person and character. We praise you, O oh God, this morning. Infinite, invisible, immortal, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and yet the God who is near, the God who loves, the God who gives, the God who is with us wherever we go, the God who sent his own son, into this world, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. And so it is that we do call you our Father. Lord, on this day, the last day of 2023, We are grateful for the year that we have lived through, that you have brought us through. We are mindful of a number of heartaches that have been a part of many of our lives and our life as a whole as a church. Having had dear loved ones, a part of this fellowship, to leave us, thankfully though, to be brought home to be with you. But we can't say, Lord, that we continue on without feeling the loss and the emptiness in those roles and in those places where they were active and filling and, and loving and serving others. And so we pray for comfort, Lord, as we look back, as well as gratitude for the ways that you've sustained us yet again. This world has been up, it's been down, and you have kept us. 
The topsy-turvy nature of the world is never going to stop until Jesus comes, but you have preserved your people, and we give thanks for that. Looking ahead, Father, we are grateful that you've given us more time, and we pray that we would redeem the time as we look to 2024. Help us serve you well. Help us deepen in our communion with you, our sense of the importance and place of praying to our Father, the pursuit of holiness and the fruit of the Spirit being born in our lives. May that be on the increase in this coming year in each of our lives. We pray for us as a church body that you would draw us closer, that you would draw us closer to you and energize us for the works that you've called us to do, to preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. We thank you for the, for the progress made all over the world in terms of gospel progress and in terms of the use of a spiritual boot camp in this in this family of faith and the missions that we support. And we pray that in 2024, we'll see ongoing works of discipleship through that tool that you've given. Lord, this morning we pray for Al Pickett and his family, Lord, as they are underneath the weight of the loss of Al's brother. We continue to lift up Troy Phillipson and June June as they make it from one day to the next, still seized in the clutches of sorrow, having lost their mates. We pray that you'd sustain them, that you would give them grace and strength for each new day, that you would not let them fall into the depths of sorrow, but that while they grieve, the hope would sustain and you would bring them out one day at a time. Before us, in these moments, Lord, lies the opportunity for us to sing your praises, to hear your word preached. And we call upon you, Father, to deliver unto this place, in this time, the power of your Holy Spirit that would enable us to enter something more than just the simplicity of making music and saying words. But that over and under it all, the power of the Holy Spirit would be known and experienced by us to bring us increased light to the darkness of our minds, to increase our knowledge of you, and also, Lord, just to cause to billow forth joy. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And in this time that we would grow Lord, I need you as I preach in just a few moments. I need you not just to be able to do the, the physical part of speaking, but I need you, I need your spirit to work or what I do is irrelevant. We need your spirit to work. So give us wisdom, give us depth of knowledge and draw us close to you. It is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing, Thou Didst Leave Thy Throne. It's another, we're still singing a couple Christmas songs today. So I invite you to stand and sing with me as, and join with me in the worship of the Lord as we sing together.
Community Church. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is uh, the operation of Grace Community Church to observe communion on the last Sunday of each month. And isn't it, once again, somewhat ironic or providential, depending on how you look at it, that every year we commemorate the Lord's death shortly after we take a day to commemorate his birth. And it is on, on his birth that we should most remember why he came. He came to redeem his people from their sins, from the curse of the law. And that curse being the condemnation that comes from the law. He came here, he lived the only perfect sinless life that will ever be lived on this planet. And then he offered himself up to his father and propitiation for our sins and for the punishment that we deserve. At Grace Community Church, you do not need to be a member of Grace Community Church to partake in communion. However, Scripture clearly states that one is to be a believer, one who has professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his substitutionary atonement on the cross for your sins, and to have been baptized as a public decoration of being a disciple of his. It is also not recommended at all that young children should partake in this, for they don't truly understand what's going on. But you may take this opportunity to explain to them why we do this. The Apostle Paul warns us not to eat the bread or drink the cup in an unworthy manner. And in the, in the context of that, he's talking about the way that we actually approach communion, the way that we, we handle ourselves through it. But he also tells us that we are to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith, if we have any known sins that we need to confess, and to examine our lives. And as the deacons pass out the elements, I ask you to do just that.
Naomi Shemi thus been handed out, let us pray. God of all good, we bless thee for the means of grace. Teach us to see in them thy loving purposes and the joy and strength of our souls. Thou hast prepared for us a feast, and though we are unworthy to sit down as a guest, we wholly rest on the merits of Jesus and hide ourselves beneath his righteousness. When we hear his tender invitation and see his wondrous grace, we cannot hesitate but must come to thee in love. By thy spirit, enliven our faith, rightly to discern and spiritually to apprehend the Savior. While we gaze upon the emblems of our Savior's death, may we ponder why he died and hear him say, I gave my life to purchase yours, presented myself an offering to expiate your sin, shed my blood to blot out your guilt, open my side to make you clean, endure your curses to set you free, bore your condemnation to satisfy divine justice. Oh, may we rightly grasp the breadth and length of this design. Draw near, obey, extend the hand. Take the bread, receive the cup, eat and drink. Testify before all men that we do for ourselves gladly in faith, reverence and love. Receive our Lord to be our life, strength, nourishment, joy, delight. In the supper, we remember his eternal love, boundless grace, infinite compassion, agony, cross, redemption, and receive assurance of pardon, adoption, life, glory. As the outward elements nourish our bodies, so may thy indwelling spirit invigorate our souls until that day when we hunger and thirst no more and sit with Jesus at his heavenly feet. Amen. The words of the Apostle Paul, as inspired by the Holy Spirit. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And God's people all said, Amen. Our next hymn is Joy is Dawn. It's a newer Christmas song, so it's one you might not be familiar with. So while the cups are going to be collected and so forth, I'm going to ask Melissa to play through the one verse, and when that's over, we'll stand and sing all four verses of Joy has Dawn.
fun preparing for the musical that we've taken the opportunity in the subsequent weeks to sing a couple of songs and we're going to sing a couple more for you today before the word is preached.
And let's take out our Bibles this morning. Turn together to Galatians chapter 4. We're going to continue our study in this important letter. It's so important because it's amazing to me in the last number of days, even in discussions that I've had with various people, uh, how critical it is that we understand what it is to say that we are justified by faith alone. And Paul is making this argument in this book. And, he, and he's coming back to different aspects of that case again and again. So let there be no doubt. There's no part of what we can do that can qualify us in any way, shape, or form to be the recipient of God's gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. There's no way that we can in any way merit justification, being declared righteous. Here we are on the eve of another new year. Tomorrow is the first day of January 2024. And you may not know this, because I didn't even know it until I realized it this past week, but this is the 161st anniversary of a momentous day in American history. 161 years ago, Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. It was on January the 1st, 1863. The proclamation declared that all persons held as slaves within the Confederate States are and henceforth shall be free. So the stroke of a pen meant that a complete change of status was in order for, could you imagine how many people? About three and a half million enslaved people. Their identity, their place in society changed in a moment. Completely changed in a moment. And in our text this morning, the Apostle Paul draws attention to another and far more momentous event by which slaves were granted freedom. Those freed slaves include all who put their faith in Jesus. So let's turn to Galatians chapter 4 and let's read together the Word of God, verses 1 to 7, in this fourth chapter of Paul's epistle, if so very important epistle. And here he writes, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, 
Father. So, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Let's pray. Father, we are so blessed. We are so blessed to have your word. And we are so blessed to be able to read it. We are so blessed that we live in an age where many who have studied your word with great care and attention to its authority and inerrancy have been gathered together in many different books as witnesses to help explain and help expound the very thing that you're saying in this passage. And so we give thanks for those opportunities. But we know that even as we gather today and think about words, and even speaking and reading, that when it comes to spiritual transformation, it doesn't happen apart from supernatural work. That supernatural work of God through your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of your Son about whom this very passage reminds us. And so as we come to pray before we study and expound today, we pray, Lord God, please help us by the power of your Spirit. Please pour out your Spirit upon this preacher. And please pour out your Spirit upon everyone who listens. So that having gathered here today, having opened this book, we are changed. We are empowered. We are prepared. We are even made fruitful by His work through the Word that the Holy Spirit inspired. We ask it in Jesus' name, our Savior and Lord, who delivered up Himself for us on Calvary's cross. We pray it in His name. Amen. You may be seated. So Paul concluded the third chapter of this letter asserting that the law held us captive under itself and acted as a guardian or a manager until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. And now, since that has happened, we're no longer under a guardian. We're no longer under a manager. We are sons and we are heirs. And now in chapter 4, Paul is providing a further explanation of his previous remarks lest he be misunderstood. See how verse 1 of chapter 4 demonstrates it? He says, I mean that. So in other words, it's just like you say one thing and you sense maybe somebody hasn't fully understood you. And what I mean is, and so you go into a further effort to explain, and that's what Paul is doing here. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, even, if, even though he owns it all. But he's under guardians and managers until the time set by his father. So Paul makes a reference again to this, uh, to this practice in ancient society. Fathers set a date when their children would no longer be under guardians and managers, but they would ascend from the level of heir in waiting to the level of actual ownership. And when that date arrived, that was the fullness of the time. At that time, everything dramatically Changed. There was an about face. There was a quantum leap in the nature of the child's position. He went from being treated no differently than a slave to the position of owner and possessor and manager himself as uh, of what had belonged to his father, as a son that he is. So Paul's focal message in these seven verses is of the three phases that are involved in this magnificent changeover from slave-like to sun-like. He sums it up down in verse 3, these three phases. So you are no longer a slave, phase 1, but a son, phase 2. And if a son, then an heir, phase 3. The initial phase is enslavement, the subsequent phase is sonship, and the final resulting phase is the inheritance that sons receive the gifts that come from their father. So I want us to examine these three phases this morning, and we start with that initial one. Uh, this speaks of the chains of enslavement. The heir 
as long as he is a child, says Paul, is no different from a slave. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved. Well, when were we children? Not just when we were children, when we were like seven or eight years old and younger, but when we were children in the part of the text means before Christ came. We were enslaved. Our condition by nature is a condition of enslavement. Until the fullness of time, the child, though he is owner of everything, is under guardians and managers. They are in charge of him and not vice versa. They tell him what to do. They manage what is his, even though he will one day own it all. The guardians and managers tell him what to do. He's under their care and direction. And often these guardians were themselves the slaves. And they were entrusted with the responsibility to exercise oversight of the estate until the heir reached the appropriate age. Says Paul, in the same way, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Do you remember elementary school? For some of us, that is further back than for others of us. It's a little ways back for me, but there's something I just can't shake out of my elementary experience. I was in the first grade when this event happened. And you know, in elementary school, everyone has to walk in a straight line. No talking, no foolishness, or any of that stuff. There I was at Morrison Elementary School in Clemson, South Carolina. When I was in first grade, my teacher, Mrs. Ashworth, was insisting like all other teachers, that we walk orderly and quietly. And I recall this one day in particular on which I was not being orderly and I was not being quiet. In fact, I was stirring up stuff. I was tickling another child. And uh, Mrs. Ashworth came up to me and said, Go to the end of the line, young man. So I went to the end of the line, and the result was that when I walked into the classroom, it seemed like everybody else had already gotten in their seats, and they were all staring at me and looking. And in front of everybody, Mrs. Ashworth wrapped her hands around my shoulders and shook me real good and gave me a what for? and told me I shouldn't be doing those things that I was doing ever again. Tickling and talking were not allowed when we were walking through the hallway. Now, I don't know, and I don't kind of think that teachers do that kind of thing anymore. Uh, but she sure got my attention, and I would say there was a lasting impact. That encounter put in me the fear of Mrs. Ashworth for the rest of the year and every other teacher I would ever have for the rest of my life. But that is what the law does. The law, it imprisons, it holds captive, it treats people like slaves, it gets our attention to show us the dreaded consequences of our guilty disobedience. Paul says, we were enslaved by the elementary principles of the world. There's a lot of discussion among scholars and commentators about what exactly these elementary principles of the world refer, what they refer to. Rather than going into all the possibilities, I really think the best thing here is just to see them as the means by which people under demonic influence, because it's not from God, come to believe that they are somehow able to bring about their justification through their own personal goodness through their own, own personal act. They are, they're, they're, they're subject to these elementary principles, be they principles of law or being, there, being the possibility that Paul's actually speaking of spirits of darkness here. Spirits of darkness uh, are like nothing better than for people to believe that some principles of how you live are key to getting you right with God. Because if you believe that, then you are confused and wrong and doomed. Any such attempt to, 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 to get your justification through your own personal goodness is enslaving. 
The harder you try, the harder it gets. Instead of making a way, you make the way harder. We don't want to be told what to do. We simply rail against some of these regulations, and then we keep them thinking they make us good. Nevertheless, all the while, we yearn for freedom, freedom from these chains. But we cannot free ourselves. We are enslaved to sin. We walk in the passions of our flesh. We follow the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And yet continually we falsely hope that we can be saved somehow if we will just do this or do that. When slaves were brought to the United States, a host of individuals were responsible for their misery and for the despicable conditions in which most of them lived. To be the property of another human being, to be treated as less than a whole person, to be taken advantage of, they were taken from their homeland by coercion and brought as forced labor to work in the fields in the New World. Similarly, the Israelites in Egypt were conscripted. Well, they weren't exactly taken hostage to begin with, but finding themselves in a foreign land, they became slaves as they were conscripted and brought as forced labor to work in, the, uh, to work in, in Pharaoh's building projects. They were overworked and unappreciated, and their weary cries went up to God. Such is the spiritual state under which the tyranny of the devil of those exist who have not come to Christ. They are enslaved and in chains of sin. They need a kind of help that they are unable to give themselves, and that's you and me by nature. We are unable to help ourselves, and we long for freedom and relief. And that's phase one. In the chains of enslavement and longing for freedom, unable to set ourselves free. And so we turn next to phase number two. This magnificent changeover goes from that chained, enslaved position to the freedom of sonship. We were, we who believe in Jesus, we who've rested in him, trusted in his work, we were enslaved. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the details of the birth of God's son about which Paul speaks here. So we won't repeat that. But here is God's answer to the enslavement of human beings under the elementary principles of the world. He sends His Son. The Son's mission is to redeem those who are under the law so that they might receive adoption as sons. So we have three key ideas here. Redemption, adoption, and sonship. Let's think about each one of those as we seek to understand and grab a hold of this idea of being uh, of the freedom of sonship. And it does start with this idea of redemption. Because redemption is the word that leads us to the concept of freedom. It arises from the context of slavery. There it was the purchase of it was the purchase price of a slave's freedom. That was what redemption brought about. Being redeemed means our prior condition was one of slavery. However, in redemption, a ransom is paid. And so thinking back to the enslavement of the Israelites in Egypt, we might ask, was there a ransom that was paid, a redemption price that was paid for the freeing of the Israelite nation? And the answer would be yes, there was. It was not a price that was paid to Pharaoh, for he did not own the Israelites. But the redemption price was paid to God in His work of redeeming the people and bringing them out from under the slavery. The redemption price was the Passover lamb. God required the death of every firstborn son. 
in Egypt, and yet he instructed the Israelites in the place of their sons to sacrifice a spotless lamb and to paint the blood of said lamb on the doorposts of their dwelling. So that then when the angel of death sent by the Lord came to bring the just judgment upon the people, when he arrived at the doors over which was painted the blood of the lamb, they would pass over them and only execute the doors where the blood was not painted. The price of the lamb's blood was accepted in the place of the death of the firstborn. And thus God's son, Israel, was redeemed. So the families had to supply the lamb and the blood. And this was the substitution for the blood of the firstborn sons. Passover foreshadows the redeeming work of Christ. He was the spotless lamb of all spotless lambs, the truly spotless lamb. On the cross, his blood was shed as a ransom price for those enslaved in sin under the law. And the blood of Jesus, his death, that is, provides redemption for slaves reeling under the chains of enslavement to Satan, sin and its curse. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In Christ, in Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. We're in a day when, and I guess it's always been the case in certain ways, but it's just not fashionable to speak of somehow a price being paid that results in forgiveness. It's not fashionable in our day to speak or think as though God actually worked in this way, that there was a price that was paid in exchange for the freedom and deliverance of sinners. They'd rather look at it in a number of any other ways but this one. But the Bible simply will not let us get away from it. Redemption involves a price paid in exchange for the freedom of the slave. And the good news is that Jesus paid it all. The question is, are you trusting in Jesus and the price that he paid as your ransom for your redemption? If not, you're still enslaved. And you will die enslaved if you will not repent and turn to Christ. On the other hand, if you are trusting in Jesus, what a glorious reality. You are free. When Jesus died, this the proclamation was signed in his blood, so to speak. God sent forth his Son to redeem those who are under the law. Free from the penalty of sin. Free from the power of sin. Eventually we'll be free from the presence of sin. We're also free from the law. But these are truths we will live out and we will rejoice to do so by the power that God gives us. So the first word was redemption. The second one is adoption. God sent forth His Son to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption. We were bought out from under slavery in order to belong to God's family as adopted sons. Could you um, stop and imagine for just a minute with me what it might have been like when Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Let's imagine that you had been a slave for the whole of your life. Yet after all those years, up rides a government official into the plantation where you are working, spreading the word that by the stroke of a pen, all slaves are now free. Freedom is wonderful. But now, where do you belong? Where will you go? Where will you live? How will you get food? Before, your master looked out for you. Now that you are free, the world is suddenly dumped on your shoulders. Now, don't get me wrong. There can be no doubt that this newfound freedom was sweet. But 
Now there is a new host of challenges that accompanied the freedom. Listen, son of God, child of God. God sent his son so that you might be redeemed. But he redeemed you so that you might be adopted into his family. As a son, you have a place to belong. The proclamation, you are free, is not just an empty proclamation that loads a bunch of responsibility on your back now that you have no idea of having to answer the issues that face you. Because with the proclamation of freedom comes the assurance that you have a place to belong because you're a son. You're a son of God. Think for a moment about the magnificent love of the Father in Jesus' parable about the prodigal or lavish son. Here was that father waiting and watching for the return of his wayward son who had spent all his money living in such ways as to waste that money in the worst possible ways he could. But here he comes, dragging himself home, about to starve to death. The father sees him and does a most undignified thing. He girds up his loins and he runs. Not away from his son. Not away from this son who had taken all he had to give him and squandered it all. Not home to get a, a staff with which to beat him. Not to the city to tell all the villagers to come out and see what this rotten son of his had done who dared to return home. But he was running to the son. And when they reach one another, the father hugs and kisses his son repeatedly and joyously and gladly. The son begins his prepared speech. I am no longer worthy to be your son. Not even to be called your son. And the father says, nonsense. Bring a robe. Bring a ring. And kill the fattened calf because this, my son, is alive again. That is your Father in heaven if you belong to Jesus. To be His Son is to belong in one who has all the resources despite how you've lived, despite all your past, despite all of your wrong and all of your sin. He is there to receive you with the wealth and resources of glory be at your disposal. God is an incredible father, the most incredible ever. There is no greater privilege than to be his adopted son. But that is what you are if you are in Christ through faith. Every Christian should be encouraged and strengthened by knowing that this is your father in heaven. In us should be cultivated the desire to be a group of adopted sons, a family of adopted sons who show forth the heart of our Father, that others see in us what we see in Him. These hearts will welcome the repentant sinner ourselves. These hearts will long for the unity of the people of God. These, these hearts will not look upon the sinners that come as the, as the older son looked upon his younger brother. They will rejoice with heaven that a sinner has repented and come to be part of this family. These hearts will rest in peace knowing who our Father is and rejoice to be more and more like that Father every single day. That's phase two, sonship. Be a son of God. And now finally, I want you to see the gift of sonship moving into the third phase. And what is ours because we belong to Him? There's one major focus that Paul has for us here in these verses. It's an inexpressible blessing to be picked up off the street and brought into the household and family of God, to be adopted into God's family as his son. 
But there is more. God has a special gift for those who become his adopted sons. Think, thinking of Christmas this past week, you know, there's been much gift giving. It's a blessing to be able to give gifts to others to show, you know, you love and appreciate them. And yet, speaking as a parent and as a grandparent, the gifts we gave to our children and grandchildren were the ones that, well, we spent the most money and gave the most thought to what we gave. It's not that we didn't care about the others. It's this, this was where the care was the greatest, naturally. And these are where we were really watching intently as they opened the gifts. Likewise, God has given his best gifts to his sons. To begin with, he gave his only son to redeem you. He sent forth him that we might be redeemed and receive adoption. And now having adopted us, he's, giving us an, he's given us another incredible gift. The gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul states in verse 6, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, I just want to point something out to you that I don't really plan to make a lot of, but I want you to see it. In, this, in this ver these seven verses, you have two instances of God sending. God sends His Son, and God sends His Spirit. We see that God sent His Son, and Jesus accomplished what He came to do. And then we see that the Spirit came also at God's bidding, so that He could accomplish what God wanted Him to do. And what was that? To come into our hearts and bring... Not just the, the news of transformation, not just the news of freedom, but the reality of transformation and the reality of freedom, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is highly significant. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit by which God Himself is at work to testify to us and assure us that we are His children. I, in fact, if we belong to Him. But He sends His Spirit into our hearts to bring the awareness and the assurance and the powerful truth that we belong to God as His sons. Part of the Lord's intent of this gift is our cry unto God that He is Father. Every time we bow our heads and pray, Father, it is by the work of God's Spirit if we're truly lifting our hearts up to God in this way as our Father. As lawbreakers, we experience the inward cry of our shame and guilt. And how do we look to God? As judge. But having been redeemed and set free from the law through the work of Jesus Christ, we now no longer see God as judge. The Holy Spirit, according to Romans 8, 15 to 16, and what we see here in Galatians causes us, causes us, to cry, Abba, Father. He bears witness to our spirit that we are children of God. So the sending of the Spirit confirms that we are children of God deep within the recesses of our own being. And the result of the Spirit's testimony within our heart is that we ourselves turn to God and acclaim Him as Father. And not just Father, but in these words here, Abba. Father, He's no longer our judge. We are His sons and we are assured of His adoption into His family. And there is further point here of significance. Not that you don't just simply call Him Father, but these words here that, that are what are brought to our hearts by the Spirit are these words, Abba, Father. And you've probably heard explanations on this word Abba before. And I would remind you of this, that that the, word, the use of the word Abba, I know this is a repetition, Father, Father, Abba, Father. It's, but there's some intensity here. There's a sense in which you know you have His attention. Think how God uses this technique Himself. With Abraham, when Abraham has raised the knife to slay his son, there on the altar, remember what the Lord said? Abraham, Abraham. People who are said to be 
surprised at the end of the age when Jesus returns and they're not on their way to heaven. They say, Lord, Lord, did we not? Here, Father, Father, Abba, Father. There's an intensity here that just reinforces the truth of the fact that they are sons. It's a joy and a delight for them to call God their Father. But there's also this aspect of intimacy and access. The fact that you can cry out, Abba. The fact that God condones for you to say this name of His. He sent His, his own Spirit into your heart to cause you to cry out, Abba. Father. And this thing that you call out, this, these words are... are a, for example, it, this is saying, when you say Father in the Abba sense, it is like with, the, with closeness and assurance, the closeness and assurance by which a child says Dad or Daddy. It is this intimate closeness that is reflected. As Melissa and I contemplated being grandparents, we were asked what we wanted to be called. And we both put a good deal of thought into it. And Melissa chose Honey Graham. And I think... Honey Graham suits her just fine. For one thing, Melissa means honeybee, so that's cute. But for the reality, you know, Melissa's sweetness and joyfulness are just reflected in that sweetness you hear when you're honey. And Honey Graham, it sounds intimate, and it sounds like you have access. It sounds like you could be considered really dear. Well, I chose Granddad. I... I wanted to be called by a name that wasn't formal, but reflected intimacy. I want, also wanted one that the kids wouldn't mind using when they grow older. Like I gave to my grandfather, Popo. Now, when I was about 6th, 7th grade, I began to feel like, this is really kind of strange. That's all I know how to call him, though, and I kept doing it, and I've never stopped. But sometimes I wondered, what do people were thinking? I'm, he's talking about Momo and Popo? Well, you know... So, so I, you know, since I had some influence on it, I chose Granddad. And uh, it's kind of funny that what the grandkids actually call us at this point, Becca calls Melissa Honey Bam. Honey Bam. And what Titus and Rebecca call me sounds more like Dada. In fact, when me and Philip are together, we have to say, me or you? Dada. It, Dada and Dadad. That's the difference. But we love it. Melissa and I love it when they call us Honey Graham and Granddad, Dada. We love it because we feel we are close to their hearts. It is amazing that God Himself has this very same objective in sending His Spirit into our hearts because Abba is like if it was granddad, it would be like granddad. It would be if it was if it was a, a grandmother, it would be like honey grand. And to think that God says the purpose that He sent His Spirit into your heart is so you'll cry out in this way. Access, intimacy, joy, and this sense that you can come to the Lord in this way. By His Spirit, we have been granted His ear and His heart and His love. By His Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. We must never overlook the holiness and majesty and glory and greatness of God. We should not be irreverent with the Lord. But here's part of what makes our sonship mind-boggling. The one true God, creator of heaven and earth, infinite, eternal, omniscient, omnipotent, nevertheless wants His children to treasure their intimacy with Him. He wants us to cherish that we have immediate access to Him. He wants us to indulge in our first name and informal basis with Him. We can come to Him as we are. Call out to Him at any time with any need and any expression of our state of mind and state of heart. Better that we call out to Him. That way certainly than any other way, even when the times are bad and even when we need to repent for the way we call out. 
And we should cry out to the Lord with the confident assurance that He always has our best interest in mind. He did not spare His own Son, but sent Him forth, born of a woman under the law to redeem those who were under the law so we might receive adoption as sons. If God would deliver up His Son for us in this way, how will He not also with Him graciously give us everything we need, everything that is good and that will feed our eternal joy? He will not. He will not hold back. This should be assurance of the greatness and wonder of what God has designed to pour out upon us who are His people. Brothers and sisters, how should we respond to these truths? Well, number one, empowered by the grace of God in our union with Christ, we should relentlessly cry out, Abba, Father. When you wake up in the morning, Abba, Father. When you're on your way to work, Abba, Father. When you're working, Abba, Father. When you take your lunch break, Abba, Father. When you're driving home, Abba, Father. When you get home, Abba, Father. When you're spending time at home, Abba, Father. And before you fall asleep, Abba, Father. Pray without ceasing is the way Paul puts that. We should pray without ceasing, relentlessly crying out to God. He wants our voice. He gives us His ear. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and answered his cry. Prayer should be a constant. It's always a good thing too at the beginning of a new year, end of, a, end of one on the verge of another. What's your prayer life like today? Give yourself an A through an F. Don't tell me what it is, but give it to yourself. I think almost all of us always say, well, it needs improvement. That's, a, that's the grade I got when I was, well, I wouldn't say, well, I guess I probably got one N when I was in elementary school. I always strove for the E's and the G's. Excellent, good, but needs improvement. But almost always our prayer needs improvement. But it doesn't get improved by necessarily just sheer effort. It gets improved by us remembering and recalling and bearing in mind who it is we're talking to. And the fact is that the Spirit is the one who produces that awareness within us. Cry out to God, Father, Abba, let me know you better. Let me walk with you more closely. Prayer should be a constant. And we should be pouring out our hearts to God in communion and fellowship. Let us go deep with the One who wants us to know both His majesty and holiness and at the same time His delight in being close to His children. And not only should we overflow regularly in prayer, we should respond to these truths with an assured faith. I mean, if there's anything you get from these truths, it should be, yes, He does love even me. It is unmistakable. We can trust God no matter what. We're going to encounter tests to our faith. But we have to go back again and again to the demonstration of the unconditional and deeply caring love of God. I think of these Israelites as they made their way out of Egypt onward toward the land of promise. What were they doing? Whenever they encountered trouble, various threats and challenges, lack of water, lack of food, the threats of the enemy, they would complain, Moses, why would you bring us out here to die? But perhaps their most staggering response was, let's just go back to Egypt. And whenever I read that response, whenever I encounter it, I want to say to those people, as though I never should say it to myself, but I want to say it to them, are you kidding me? Go back to Egypt? You really think that was better? Back to slavery? Back to the other side of all those miraculous works of rescue that the Lord has provided for you? You've seen His hand again. And again, and now when you face another challenge, you fold and wilt as though it's all too big for God, as though God doesn't care what happens to you out here? Come on! That's what I want to say to them. And yet you and I, many times, don't we, 
Don't we tend to respond to challenging situations just like those Israelites? We must be reminded this morning of the love of Abba and the purpose of Abba and the gifts of Abba. Oh, I trust your confidence in his leading and providing and protecting and directing your life will be raised up a notch or two this morning. He sent forth his son for your redemption and he has sent forth his spirit for your adoption. There is nothing he won't do that is good for you. Rest in him. Trust in him. Pray always to him and do not lose heart. Now there's just one more thing. And I want to close this message this morning by addressing this other question. The question that's really the overarching question in the letter of Galatians. And that's this question. How does this text contribute to the overall point that Paul is making in this letter? Remember that overall point? It is that these Galatians must not dare resort to going back to works of the law in order to be justified with God. No one has been able to be right with God on the basis of their work, and they should not resort to such a mindset now. What no ordinary human being could do, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of human flesh. To seek justification and salvation by adding obedience to the law as a component of what it takes to be justified is like Israel wanting to turn back to slavery in Egypt. They would relinquish their freedom for being back under the tyranny of Pharaoh? Are you kidding me? No, that's obviously a grave mistake. So Paul is saying for anyone to go back to the law is the same exact Thing. It is returning to enslavement when God has made you a son and an heir. Now, is Paul saying that it doesn't matter how we live? Come on. We know better than that. He's not saying that believers should not pr pursue righteousness. He is saying, though, that believers should pursue righteousness as a fruit of their union with Christ, not as a means of being right with God. God has already taken care of that. Praise His name. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, oh, our Abba, oh, the one who cares for us, who when we run away, Lord, stands there with open arms to receive, the one who makes us part of your family to share with you all the riches of glory in heaven. You have shared with us. You had sent your own Son. You have in. You have put him forth so that he even died. Thankfully rose again. But you did not withhold your one and only son. How will you not with him freely give us all things? And if that is who you are, how, should, how is it that we would withhold from you our prayers, our attention, our lives, any, any shred of anything that belongs to us. People, Lord, it seems like people want to know what God's going to give them. And Lord, it, it's clear you give your people an overabundance. Our cups run over. The question is, what do we give? And how satisfied, how easily satisfied are we thinking we gave an extra dollar in the offering We gave an extra five minutes to prayer this week. Lord, convict us of our, of our shameful failure to see that you are Abba. And draw us close. And may this coming year be a year in which the depth of our walk, by the power of God, through the Holy Spirit, becomes deeper and richer and fuller. Praise be to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to close this morning with uh, standing and singing the doxology. So I'm going to have Melissa play it through once and then we'll sing it with her.
creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Now before I read the benediction to you, I believe the chairs have to come up. We had a week off last week, but this week we have to take it all down and uh, remind you that, uh, oh, 1215, I guess, was a good time to say. Uh, the prayer gathering will be in, I think, 204 at 1215, and I hope that you can join us for that. And now, in this new year, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make His face to shine upon you and give you peace. And now i got a couple other things. Kathleen Case, I don't want you leaving before I see you. And then I think I saw Mickey, Frank, and Bill. i got something for you too. I'll see you right now, but I saw you before if you're still here. Hang on. Uh, don't leave without talking to me. Amen.